All I'm thinking then is you have got to miss those propellers. The driver had no idea that I was in the water. He doesn't see me. And I knew I don't have enough time to swim to either side. I thought, Stephanie, your best bet at survival at this point is to surface dive. Get as far as you can below the surface of the water. Hold your breath. The propellers will pass over top. It's going to be fine. But... Not only a Paralympian, a four-time Paralympian, three-time Paralympian medalist, five-time world record holder. In our minds, we all want to be awesome at everything, and that's just unrealistic. And actually, I think life is about finding that one thing you're really good at and then just taking it to the next level. You have to go all in. What you need to have is the ability to believe in yourself and keep taking those little steps and those little risks year after year after year, and that is when you're gonna see the magic. After one fateful day on on a lake in Canada. Our guest's life changed in the blink of an eye. While wallowing for a moment, a nurse challenged her. Who would guess this was the start of a competitive champion's rise? And I just felt like I was spinning down a really dark path. And it was actually terrifying. It was terrifying because Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became, where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. Hi, I'm Steph Reed, and this is How I Became a Paralympian and a Keynote Speaker. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way, and we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. After one fateful day on a lake in Canada, our guest's life changed in the blink of an eye. While wallowing for a moment, a nurse challenged her. Who would guess this was the start of a competitive champion's rise? Adapting to life without rugby, it did seem like her sports dreams had come to a stop. Until she received her first blade, a new path had been laid for a new love that would take her to the top. The life of an athlete, sky-high moments and down peaks, many continents and countries she's been to. Breaking world records, pivoting her main track sports, then more wins, losses and learnings she's seen too. It's not just where you're going, it's also where you have been. Life's journeys, ups and downs are important. Introducing Steph Reed. Paralympian, MBE, keynote speaker of the human side of performance. Wow, I love it. Welcome. Thank you. Wow, what a welcome. I've never had that before. <laughs> <laughs> we like to start it in a unique way. Ash, Take so me the... back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is is your life in a poem. Now we're going to delve into the story of yes. how you became not only a Paralympian, a four-time Paralympian, three-time Paralympian medalist, mm -hmm. Five-time world record holder, whoa, and uh, and a world champion. It's pretty pretty amazing. Um, not only that, you are vice president for British Athletics, um, and a keynote speaker, high performance coach. As you are now retired from athletics, and some interesting ones. You're the first amputee to walk down the catwalk at London Fashion Week, mm. which is pretty cool. And you've done it twice now. Yes, I just did it again uh, a few weeks ago. It's pretty cool. Amazing. But, um, and uh, semi-finalists, the, the, the accolades carry on. This is an impressive um, list of accolades. Semi-finalists at Celebrity MasterChef in 2018, for anybody who watched that. There's lots of fans of that. And quarter-finalist on Dancing on Ice 2022. Um, so we're going to share the story of how you achieved all these amazing things. To start with, let's take it back to where it all begins. Life does not begin in Great Britain, the, the country that you competed for the most and won your medals with. It does not start in Canada, where you lived. Where does it begin? <laughs> so yes, as you can tell from my accent, um, I had quite a diverse geographical upbringing. So I was actually born in New Zealand to British parents. My dad is Scottish and my mum is English. And they just, love traveling and they decided to take all of us kids with them so we we went to a few different places spent a year in hawaii but eventually wow. we settled down in toronto in canada 
which is where I spent most of my schooling life. So I did high school there and university. And then I ended up, um, my husband Brent is from the French part of Canada, but he went to Dallas, Texas on a sports scholarship. And so when we got married, we ended up living in Texas for about four years. And in the background, um, I ended up moving to London ahead of the London 2012 Paralympics. And we've been living here for the past 10 years. So hopefully that clears up my accent. That's yeah. <laughs> so your journey around the world. Hawaii sounds pretty cool. Yeah, um, sounds awesome. Okay, so paint paint the picture of your so you're you're living in Toronto. Um, what was what was your childhood like? What was the what were you doing? How was how are things? My childhood was awesome. Um, I was I was really lucky. I I had two parents who um, you know just worked really hard and also had a lot of fun, and they were also really really focused on education. Neither of them had the chance to go to university. And, and that really was their dream for their kids. Um, well, actually, it was two dreams for my mom anyways. She she really wanted to send all of her kids to university, and she wanted all of her kids to have braces and Hollywood teeth. <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and she did it. And yeah, so, nice. um, Yeah, we're really thankful for that. So I was really lucky in that I they really wanted to send us a private school, didn't quite have the budget for it, but ended up finding a private school that was kind of within budget. And so it was just a really small intimate upbringing, which was probably quite good for me. Um, but the other thing at this school is that there was lots of sports on on offer. And so every single day I played or did something. And I grew up doing everything from basketball to volleyball to cross country to swimming to tennis. And it was just, it was fantastic. And you meet this P teacher who inspires you about a particular sport which is not very common for Canada or women there is a big you know sport for it and in women now but I guess probably less so back then what was this sport at 13 I was introduced to rugby and absolutely fell in love and we were so lucky in that one of our PE teachers happened to be involved um, at, at quite a high level in Canada. And so she was able to put together a team for us. And because we were based in Toronto, there was enough other schools to to have a league. But for me, it was just, well, for one, it was a first, it really was a sport that showed off all of my talents as mm. an athlete. It just suited me. But I think the other thing that I was drawn to was just the... The aggressive nature of it. I mean, never in my life as as a girl or woman do you really have that outlet where it is just okay to like to go for it. That's what you're supposed to do on the field. And I just felt like my whole life I had been not openly encouraged, but you know, just just be a little bit less, be a little less competitive, care a little bit less, be less aggressive. You know, it's not it's not what girls do. And this was just the opposite. And I thought, <laughs> I love this. So you wanted to then what was your ambitions in this sport what, what were you dreaming as a as a 14 15 year old getting into this sport I wanted to be an international rugby superstar that was it I didn't know what that looked like um uh but I just knew that is what I want to do that's where I want to be and you'd made plans like you wanted to go back to New Zealand right and, and play for the national team was that the plan or? yeah so my my well to be <laughs> my original thought was yeah I'll go back to New Zealand because that's where you know the greats play mm. and I'll go to university there because I can because I have a passport and um and I'll play there and I'll figure out quite quickly you know am I really good enough to to do this but then even in Canada things were a few of the national coaches had had watched me play and it was looking like, okay, this this ridiculous dream might actually have a shot oh, at wow. coming wow. So you, you were queued up, you were queued up, you'd been scouted to go on further. I had been, I think the issue at the time was I was very small, which I was, but you know, I was, I was only 15 and you could still grow and, and my asset was never going to be that I was, you know, huge um but I was quick and as long as I could prove I was quick and you know wouldn't get killed on the field <laughs> then it would be okay excellent so if I was to speak to a mix of people at your school at this time and say who is Steph Reed you know what what is she known for what would, how would they describe you I think they probably just committed somebody who was always all in um 
probably a bit weird. I wasn't the most, I wasn't the coolest person around, <laughs> but I was okay with that. Driven, like once I had something in my head, it was really hard to to let it go. Um, focused, uh, but also fun. Okay. And and known for winning basketball games for the for the school team and known for your rugby, I guess. Yeah, I mean that was always gonna be a part of me. I just I loved I loved all aspects of competition. I loved working hard towards something. I I loved just I mean, playing. That's what a game is essentially. Yeah. Um and yeah, I was just somebody that was always I was always all in. It didn't matter how big or how small we could be in the finals in Toronto or this could be in your backyard and we're just having a game of, of bump. Um, I was always all in. Okay, so we get to the, a day that your life changes forever. Uh, you're 15. Walk us through the events of, of the day. What What is happening? Set the scene um, and tell us what happens that day. It was possibly one of the best weekends of my life. I had spent a good month convincing my parents to let me go to my friend's house. It was a bank holiday weekend and they had a beautiful cottage beside a lake and they had invited me up. And your parents didn't want you to go, did they? No, my parents were, they were always quite strict. And and so, um, you know, they were quite careful about um, sleepovers and that sort of thing. And and so um, it did did take some convincing because it was for a long time. Um, but yeah, we, we just had the best weekend. Um, they were on a lake and so we were out swimming and they had a trampoline in the middle and they also had this boat and I was introduced to tubing, which I usually describe as lazy water skiing or unskilled water skiing. (laughs) But basically it's, um, you have a run, a rubber inner tube attached to the back of a boat and you just go flying across the water. So is it like a big inflatable, round yeah. inflatable and you stand on it or you sit no, on it? No, you sit in it. You sit on it. Lazy water ski. Yeah. I see. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you're holding on to a handle. Yeah, and I mean, and, and you are gripping on. Um, you've really got to hold on because obviously you've got a few waves and the whole point is, you know, the driver is taking um, turns and you you shoot out and, and so eventually everybody gets tired and eventually you flip off right. and, and that that's why you have a spotter and a driver because it's, it's a big boat and the driver is obviously looking forward. The spotter is the one watching at the back and letting the driver know what's happening and what what needs to happen. I see. And so we were doing that all weekend that it was super fun. And my parents were coming up to pick me up on the Monday just after lunch. So we had one more morning left. Really? So this is the last day? Yeah, last day. Literally the last day, the last few hours. Last few hours. And someone said, you know, Steph, what do you want to do? And I said, tubing, definitely. So uh, we packed up um, and then um, got in my bathing suit and, and hopped on the tube. And for whatever reason that morning, there just happened to be a miscommunication between the spotter and, and the driver. And I had fallen off the tube and the, the driver had no idea that I was in the water waiting to get back up like like he always did so the boat had now turned and was Mm. coming back towards where where you are yeah same boat and and just by coincidence um he had turned and just happened to be coming directly for me and you're thinking okay he's just coming back to collect me at this point yeah initially i thought that's fine and then i look back and i just knew immediately he is coming way too fast and i he doesn't see me and all I'm thinking then is you have got to miss those propellers. That was the one thing. And it's my mind just, there was no panic. There was no emotion. It just completely shifted into survival mode. Really? And I knew I don't have enough time to swim to either side. And I thought, Stephanie, your best bet at survival at this point is to surface dive. So to get as far as you can below the surface of the water, hold your breath. The boat will pass over top. The propellers will pass over top. It's going to be fine. So that is what I went to do. But I just forgot I had a life jacket on. And I couldn't get under. And all this time, the boat's coming closer and closer. I mean, I'm making it sound like there was ages. I mean, this this is all happening in a split split second. second. And there was, I mean, there's zips and clips. And I just knew there is nothing you can do. And again, it was no emotion. It was just 
whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Mm. And the boat came and it was just really dark. And I didn't know what was going on. I was disorientated. And just it, at one point, I just thought I am going to drown if I don't, like I'm out of breath. And, and even then I'm looking around trying to work out which way is up and which isn't. Um, it, and eventually I you know, saw some lights and just went up to the top. And I remember my first thought just being, wow, like that was really lucky. But soon after I just, I knew something wasn't right. I didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that I realized I was hit by the propellers. I did get caught. So initially you didn't think anything had happened. You thought I've escaped that. That's fine. I thought I was free and clear. Wow. Yeah. And because you described it being dark and you weren't sure which way is up again, is this all happening in a split second as the bike flies by or what? I have no idea. It must have yeah. been in a split second. Yeah. Um, but for me, that period below the, I mean, it felt like an eternity. Um, wow. You know, many ways. Yeah, it just almost felt like a different dimension. Time stopped. I have absolutely no gauge for how long I was under. And so you realize, okay, something's not right here. What happens next? Did they, when do they actually see that you're still in the water? Um, I, I mean, the... When I surfaced, the boat was was quite clear. I think someone had yelled and and just said because um, somebody was sitting near the front, and and I have a really vague memory of that person, you know, and just them screaming at the last moment, mm. and and obviously there's an engine cut that you can do. Um, so I don't I don't actually know what happened, um, just because I wasn't there. But I remember surfacing, and everyone on the boat really panicked and terrified. And the first thing I said was, "Guys, I'm fine." That was lucky. Uh, let's let's not mention this to our parents when we get back. Yeah, that's what you said to them. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in the water. At I'm, this in, point. I'm in the water. Um, but that's when I realized. Wait a second. Something does not feel right. Um, I'm going to try and explain this in the least gory way possible, but okay. just as a as a warning. So basically, I was in the water, and I just felt. Um, I was just feeling things that you probably shouldn't feel. And initially I just thought, you know, I probably just lost my bikini bottoms. Um, uh, yeah, just because yeah. I thought mm, that doesn't feel. And then I, I reached down and I realized I was touching skin and bones that I shouldn't be. And that's when I freaked out because I thought I had been cut in half at that point. Oh, my gosh. And actually the most terrifying thing was we had a lifeguard on, on board, um, one of my friends with a lifeguard. And so at this point he had swum out. And I should probably say, I mean, I have very, very vivid memories, but I was also in shock at this moment. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, so some of it is a little bit patchy, but I remember being pulled back onto the boat. And that was my big fear because I couldn't see in the water. It was so dark. I just thought, I don't even know what's mm -hmm. left. But at this point, you know something's gone. Were you thinking maybe you're cut in half? I thought I was cut in half. Um, but that was, and they pulled me on the boat and, and that was actually one of the frustrations. Um, one of one of my friends kept, I kept trying to sit up and just look. Like I need to see, I need to see the damage. I need to know. And they kept shoving my head back mm. and I couldn't see and it was really frustrating. And they were like, you could, yeah. basically they, were, they don't want you to see this. No. And so then they drive back to shore. Do they call, they call an ambulance? Um, yeah, we drove back to shore. Um, they tried to call an ambulance. The problem was that we were, I mean, we were miles away from a half decent hospital. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I think, I mean, the biggest issue was just blood loss. Um, yeah. That was, so in the end, I, the propeller did catch me across my lower back and my, my right leg. Oh, so it was two places. Two places. So yeah. that's maybe why you thought you cut in half because there was a cut on the back yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. So that was, I mean, and I know, I mean, I, I couldn't see any, I couldn't see my body, but I could see their faces and I knew this is not good. Mm. So eventually the decision was taken that the ambulance is going to take too long. So they loaded me in the back of a van and just said, look, we're going to meet you on the fly. Like we're going to drive as far as we can. Um, and then they did like a, a bit of a, I don't know, an exchange. exchange. Yeah. Yeah. On the side of the highway. And then With took an me, ambulance. In an ambulance. I see. Yeah. And then wow. took me to the closest clinic that they had. And they, at this point they'd wrapped your leg up you know and um try to stop the bleeding yeah well I, yeah 
the problem was I still had a life jacket on. Nobody quite knew where all the bleeding was coming from. Wow. Um, and then you don't want to be poking around too much mm. because you could make things bleed a bit more. But I was in the back with one of their neighbors was a nurse. And there were three people in the back with me just, yeah, doing the best that. And what's going through your mind at this point? I was terrified I was going to die. I think at that point it really was just terror because now I was 15. It was not on my radar <laughs> yeah. and it was just not something I had ever, I don't know, just prepared to deal with. And actually the terror was just, I don't have enough time to complete everything that I want to do. And apart from that, like, have I gotten it all wrong? Everything I thought was important in this moment right now, none of it matters. And so it was this fear of not having enough time and this fear of I've just gotten life completely wrong and I won't have a chance to fix it. Wow. Well, that's some, some deep thoughts to go, to go through as a 15 year old at that moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What were you thinking then was important in life? At that moment, all I was thinking about was just the people that I loved and who I had helped and what I had done of value. Because if I was really honest with myself, everything that I did was for me. Um, I, I wanted to get good grades for me. I wanted to achieve for me. I wanted to be the best I could be for me. There was just everywhere I looked in my life, it was just all about myself. And anyone else from the inside looking out would have just thought, oh, like, I don't think anyone else would have thought that. But those were my thoughts. And that's all that mattered at that point. And I just thought right now, all that I care about is I don't want to be alone. And who have I loved and who has loved me? And that was it. Everything else was gone. So you're thinking about family members. You're thinking about parents, brothers, sisters, you know. Yeah. And I just wish I had done a better job. I had been a better daughter. And I, I didn't I didn't regret going there at all. But my biggest fear, my biggest fear was my mom would blame herself, even though it was nothing to do with her. But she would feel like, oh, well, I said yes in the end. And I just wanted to make sure, like, I need her to know that is not, mm. that's not the case. So you're, you make the exchange, the ambulance is full speed to the to the hospital what, what what plays out my only memory from there is just a really white stark room and staff that were trying to hold it together i don't think this was the kind of thing that they were equipped to deal with and and just knowing the best thing that they can do is i just remember them calling around trying to find an orthopedic surgeon someone in toronto he would take on the case again. It was a bank holiday weekend, probably the worst time oh, yeah, of course, possible yeah. to to get injured. Um, but I remember by this point, my family, my mom and my dad had come and they had been called immediately. And I think my mom said that they were out walking at the time and someone had left a message on the answer machine. Mm -hmm. And even though the person left the message said the equivalent of, you know, Stephanie's cut her foot and we think you should come because they didn't want them driving wildly Panicked. like crazy people yeah, yeah. there but my mum said she knew immediately something was wrong and I just when remember she was out walking or when she heard the message when she, well, actually we had a discussion about this and she said when she was out walking she had a vision that morning of me lying in a river in a white dress hair fanned out um and it was just a really bizarre thing and then she came back to this wow. message and that's she just oh, knew wow so she just kind of put two and two together and be like Something's happening. I knew happening. there was something up yeah. or something. Yeah. Wow. The sixth sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was, I was taken aback when, when she told me this, they drove and they went like crazy people um, <laughs> because they knew that something was really wrong. And I remember them showing up and coming in. And my first, the first thing that I said was just, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. And it's weird, I think back now, and I don't know what I was apologizing for, because it wasn't that I thought it was my fault. Maybe it was just apologizing for, I don't know, I could have been a better daughter, less difficult. Um, I don't know, but that was just my first instinct. I'm sorry. Wow. And what, what did they say to you? I just remember being hugged. Um, And they said that they loved me and that I was going to be okay. 
And I thought, I know you guys are lying, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're, they're, they're trying to find a, a surgeon at this point. How does that, uh, what happens? I, I was so lucky in that they got hold of the best orthopedic surgeon in the country. Wow. Who committed to, who came in and... Um, I think it was two things. One, um, I was young, I was fit. If anyone had a chance at survival, it was me. But it was also quite um, quite lucky because he had been developing a special technique which just happened to be exactly what I needed. Wow. Um, so yeah, made it to hospital. Um, and the big issue, I mean, everyone, yes, I'm, I'm the issue with my my leg and my foot were a big deal just because of long-term consequences but the real issue was the cut i had across my back because it was right. deep it was huge it was bleeding and it was very very dirty propeller blades are not clean mm. so the biggest issue then was just sepsis and how do you how do you debride a wound this big how do you prevent debride what's that um take out all of the grit and the gross stuff that's in there lakes mm. are full of bacteria mm. they were scared about flesh eating disease mm. and pretty much your entire body is open and exposed your skin is meant to protect to protect you from that but yeah. Yeah. there had been no protection and then even if you can clean the wound properly how on earth do you, like if you can't just stitch that back together how mm. do you get the muscle and the tissue and the separation how do you get that to to stick but that was actually where Dr. Crater came in because he developed this method where basically you have a, a big wire and hanging off the wire is a, a mesh, almost like barbed wire net. And so uh, what you do is you have to clean the wound and then you kind of stick it to one side of the flesh um, and then you kind of twist it into the other side of the flesh. The, the mesh dissolves in your body and oh. you then take the wire out. So it was wow. very, very wow. lucky <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that nice. I ended up um, yeah finding him. Because at this point, you, what what's the potential of you not making it through this? I remember being in the ambulance on the way to the hospital and just getting really annoyed with the two ambulance attendants in the back with me because I was just so tired and I just wanted to have a nap. And he would just keep poking my shoulder all the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being like, can you just stop? Yeah. <laughs> like for, And I remember him looking at me and just said, I need you to stay awake. Because if you fall asleep, you might not survive this. Wow. And that was sobering. Yeah, that's a very sobering thing to be told. And from that point on, my eyes stayed glued awake. But it was also important because that was the moment I just thought, I don't want to die. Like, mm. I want to fight. I want to survive this. Um but it was, it, it was touch and go. So if you had just gone, do you know what, I'm going to take this nap. That could, that could be you just go, your body actually saying, okay, I'm done. Potentially. Wow. Scary. But you didn't. You, no, you, you didn't. Then you heard, like, I mean, thankfully he, he communicated that to you and you with the, with the drive and the passion that you had and had built up over the years of just being an achiever was like, okay, these eyes are staying oh. open. I mean, I don't know if I can take full credit um, for that, but I think I think it's two things. I think you have to have the will to fight and I want it to live. And then mm. you have to have the, I mean, they did some pretty cool things. Like, I mean, I was, I was out of blood and there's not, they can't really give you a transfusion if they don't have the equipment to know what blood type you are or have that, that kind of blood, but they can do things like pump your veins full of just plain tissue fluid to at least keep them open. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I had an amazing, um, amazing team for sure around me that did what, what they, they needed to do. Um, but I wanted to fight. I wanted to be there. And I think that matters too. Mm, definitely. So what happened next? I was put under and I, the order at this point gets a little bit skewed in my head. Yeah. Understandably. And two overriding memories, and again, I don't know what order they were in, was waking up in the hospital room and me you know, being told, you've had no spinal damage, which was amazing. Wow. You have no permanent internal injuries that we can see at the moment. Wow. Amazing. So you're thinking, good, good. It's just amazing. Yeah. Like, 
I've, I've done quite well here. Yeah. But then my mum walked in and I just, it didn't make sense because her face did not look like someone who thought this was amazing. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought something is, is not connecting. And she was the one who came in to say that, Stephanie, I'm so sorry, but the surgeon did everything he could, but he had to amputate your right foot. And that just shattered everything mm -hmm. about my world. Um, as much as I fought to live in that ambulance, I just remember thinking, I don't know that I want to do life like this. And the other memory I have is just of my mom, whose first response to the whole situation was, can you cut off my leg and give it to Stephanie and I will do the rehab or whatever it is. And I think that was a moment I just thought, wow, like that is someone who loves you more than her own life. Wow, what 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 a a thing to to su to suggest. Yeah, I mean that that's love right there. It's a mother's love. And that was a moment. Um, it's funny we never. I'm trying, we we have never fought since that moment, which is funny because <laughs> as a kid, as a teenager, oh my goodness, she was so strict, and I was convinced her life goal was just to ruin all my fun and. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was exhausting. And I just realized in that moment, we never fought again because I just knew no matter what she says, no matter what she does, even if I don't agree with it, I know exactly where the heart of it comes from. Mm. And it just wasn't worth it. I mean, that's an expression some people say. I'd take my right arm off for you mm. type thing for this. She literally effectively offered that as a leg. Without um, hesitation. Wow. So you're... You've had these ambitions to be this rugby player running around the pitch, and now you find out you don't have a foot. What are you thinking? I was angry. I just remember being angry because I did not want to sit on the sidelines watching everyone else fulfill their dream. Mm -hmm. how, how was I going to play rugby if I couldn't run? And I mean, that first week in hospital was awful. I, I was in pain. I was miserable. I didn't want to see anyone. I wouldn't eat. I just wanted my morphine and I wanted to forget. But seven days after the accident, my life changed again. Nurse Claudette walked in in the morning. I explained to her I, I didn't feel like eating. Mm -hmm. And I closed my eyes, hoping she'd get the hint and, and just leave. But when I opened them again to see if she was still there, she looked at me and she said, really kindly, but really firmly. Stephanie, it is time. It is time to move forward. Others have, and you can too. I was shocked. And you know, a little bit angry because I thought I have just had a life changing accident. I have earned my pity party. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break. Like, <laughs> exactly. I've had enough going on. And, and how are other people treating you at this point? They would walk around me like they were walking on eggshells, which, mm. which is normal. Um, this is someone you love. And um, What could I get you? Can I get yeah. you anything else? Can I get you something to drink, something to eat? Do you want a, do you want a magazine? This yeah. kind of thing. I mean, no matter how horrible I was, 
And I, I mean, I, I actually, I, I look back now and I, I suspect probably Nurse Claudette witnessed a lot of this. I remember, I mean, my mom was, again, amazing. She slept on a wooden chair beside my bed for three weeks straight oh because they eventually kicked her out because she was getting sick. And they said, look, if you don't go home and get some sleep and get better, you won't be able to see her. Mm-hmm. So for one night she went home, but I remember she was... <laughs> I still couldn't get out of bed and I wanted to brush my teeth. And so she brought me my toothbrush with some toothpaste on it. I remember yelling at her for, you know, a full minute about how I wanted the toothpaste evenly spread across (laughs) the head of my toothbrush, not in one awful little lump. And she didn't react. Yeah, I mean, I I I was awful. And I think back now, she probably stepped outside to cry. And then came back um, when she could pull it together and was as kind and cheerful as she was as she could be. Mm. That's who I was for that week. I was wow. not a great person. But but you are on morphine. You're on all these yeah. drugs and everything. You've gone it's through a serious thing. Just you as a person. This is you on various things to keep you alive. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Um, yeah. There was there was a lot going on. <laughs> but um, she she was the first person, Nurse Claudette, who walked into that room and actually expected something better from me than moping. And sometimes you need somebody outside of your friends and family mm-hmm. in that to speak into that situation and call out what it was. And, you know, maybe it was a risky strategy on her part, but this is a woman who has seen so many traumas over the course mm-hmm. of her life as a nurse. And she obviously knew when it's appropriate, when the time is right, who will respond? And I am so thankful she lay down that challenge because it actually felt really good. And she lit that spark in me that just said, yeah, you know what? I, I want to fight. Immediately you thought that or you, you got angrier for a bit and then you're like, mm, actually, you know what? She's right. Do you know, it was pretty immediate. Okay. Yeah. I remember, you know, she left making a point i ate everything on that tray <laughs> licked the bowl clean just to make my point yeah and it's not that you know life suddenly was perfect after or that you know again i was i still had my moments but i decided i mean, i had no idea what life was going to look like mm-hmm. i had no idea if i i was still on the fence about whether or not i even wanted that kind of life but mm-hmm. i just thought i I'm going to try and I will not be a victim here. I'm not going to, my life story is not going to be the victim of an unfortunate accident. Mm. If nothing else, this will be an adventure. Yeah. Wow. Ash, I'm just going to ask what, um, for people listening, what's the lesson in that? I'd look at the nurse as a key, a key catalyst and we can see this nurse character, we can all be this nurse character in our lives. To say that thing to someone when they're down, to encourage them or to challenge them. I think challenge is such a, such a great catalyst because then it puts, the, it puts the choice in the hands of the person that's being challenged. You know, are you gonna sit there and just like mope or be down or are you gonna do something about it? You have the choice. And then leaving that seed with someone it can grow. It can grow into a world champion. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it takes a special person to have the guts Mm -hmm. to sometimes say the hard thing Mm -hmm. that that needs to be said. And you're right. I think we all need Nurse Claudettes in our life Mm -hmm. and we all need to be a Nurse Claudette for someone. Mm -hmm. And and then also just if you're on the other side of it, how you respond to that person, you know, because the Nurse Claudette can say the thing but then how does that person react? And it's then that's down to you. So you're going to go stay in that mode of this isn't going to work out, you know, stay in basically in a negative mindset. You're going to go, okay, take a breath. You're right. I'm going to have to change some things. I'm going to have to change how I think about things. I have to change my perspective and I'm going to find the energy somewhere in me to just move forward. You know, as much as I don't want to, I want to stay in this place where I can just say and do what I want and just because I've earned this right to be you know whatever I want to be and anyone can say anything more am I going to really make a change and and that's what you you did but actually you summarize it like that that is 
you mentioned this idea of choice. And I think that is the most powerful thing you can give to someone. It's not like anything about my circumstances changed, but she just showed me you have a choice. Mm. Um, and even if it's not the choice I wanted, it was still a choice. And I think maybe that was it. I just finally felt like, okay, I have some power and some ownership. All these things, it's not that they're happening to me. Um, and I'm just sitting here powerless. Like I can still choose what I'm going to do and how I'm going to respond. Interesting. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It opens up a different way of, of being at that point rather than thinking the only option now is to be in this yeah, negative pity mindset. You're on your road to recovery. I think you spend three weeks in hospital. Then, you, then you're like, I think you, you told us, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. I need to go home. Is that right? Yeah. I was, oh, so boring. <laughs> and I remember this was 2000. You know, it's not like there were screens and TVs and you Spotify and Netflix. TikTok and Netflix, no. <laughs> oh, it was awful. I hated being in hospitals so much. And so I... And there was done... a point you told us that you, like, you couldn't even read a magazine or read a book because... Yeah. Oh, it was... So uh, I mentioned they they gave me not blood but fluids, just trying to keep um, you know veins open and flowing. The problem is that all this fluid gets stuck in your body, mm. and uh, in my case, it got stuck in my eyelids. Oh my! And I didn't even know this was possible, but basically, my eyelids blew up. They swelled so much they covered half my face, which then meant I couldn't even open my eyes, so I couldn't even read. And so it was just this awful scenario of having to lie, I had to lie in a certain way as well because I had all of the um, the bandaging and the stitches across um, my backside. And it was just, it was just miserable. Um, and so at the moment I had the option, I was out of the hospital, I at least wanted to go home and, and I had a, a nurse that would visit every day. Um, but the big thing, and I think the most helpful thing was was just cracking on. I think the idea, it happened in August, school started in September everyone thought I was going to wait until January. I'd miss the first school term and go back. But I thought, no, I want to go to school. Like, um, I had a good friend, Peter, who, you know, we were quite competitive academically. I thought, Peter's going to get ahead. <laughs> and then I'm going to have so much catching up to do. I thought, no, I just, I need to be there, even if I'm falling asleep every afternoon. Okay. So tell us about this first day you go back, because mm. you previously were this sporty person who's out there winning games, wanting to be a rugby player. And now you're coming back in crutches um as a totally different person maybe and what are you thinking before you go to school walking in that first day was probably one of the scenarios in my life where i needed the most courage that i've ever had it was terrifying and it was terrifying because i i felt like i didn't know who i was anymore my identity was so wrapped up in in sport and being an athlete and achievement that I didn't know who I was anymore. I was now this person that couldn't play sport, couldn't win games for people. And it's really scary walking somewhere, walking into a scenario where you don't know who you, people didn't know how to respond to me. Oh, they were amazing. Um, but again, it's just, it's hard for everybody because nobody quite knows where you're at. Nobody knows the right thing to say. You know, it's just this um, really, really weird day. But my fear was just, no one's going to like me anymore. I can't win a game for you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tired all the time. I'm not that much fun to be around. Um, you know, I'm slow. I'm on crutches. And, and just, I think I ended up going in preparing myself for the fact that you're just, you know, it's, it's okay. You're going to be alone a lot, but that's okay. And, and you'll, you'll carry on. And I think what took me most aback was just the fact that people still wanted to be around me and speak with me and include me. For me, that was just one of the most amazing lessons in my life that who I am, who we all are is so much deeper than, than just what you do. And yeah, I'd have to wait after school for my mom to come and pick me up. Usually I would play sports, but I couldn't do that anymore. But just the fact that someone would just want to come and sit and have a conversation. And it was just, wow, like I can still give to someone just speaking. It was probably one of the best lessons I could have learned. And I'm so glad I learned it that young. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a powerful lesson at that early age. What, do you want to draw anything out from that in terms of lessons for people? 
we'll just never underestimate the power of human kindness. And sometimes what we believe or what we think could be the case is in fact not. And sometimes we do default to the worst case scenario, but it sounded like there as well, you you accepted that that could have been a possibility, which could have kept you, which would have kept you all right if that was, but in fact it was not. And you know, you were able to experience some great things of people spending time to go out of the way to, you know, talk to you and make sure that you're good. Do you know what? And actually, I think I ended up being the one suffering from my own assumptions because mm. probably that's how I saw the world. Mm. I assumed, well, if someone has nothing to offer, then um, then they're not going to be as sought after. Mm. That was my hang up. Mm. And then when I became that person, I assumed everyone else felt like that. Mm. And then I realized, no, like that was just my presupposition and my, my thing that I had to get over. Mm. But it sounds funny when you say it, like listening to you say that that's how you thought people were going to behave. You're like... That's ridiculous. People are going to be nice. They're going to, why would people leave you out? Like, you've been through something incredibly traumatic that people want to care for you. But it's interesting how the mind can just shift how things are going to play out, you know, in a, in a negative way, um, which at the same time is understandable. But from the outside perspective, it's, it's mm -hmm. funny to hear. Okay, so we fast forward a little bit. How do you, you've gone, you've gone from being this super sporty person and you know wanting to be an international rugby superstar and doing sports all the time training probably hours and hours a week how do you then find the energy to sort of reinvent yourself or put that energy in a new direction what what happens that was i realized well, <laughs> that's what actually it was i'm so glad i went back to school early and it was just a moment i had in a math class where I raised my hand and, and was beginning to correct the teacher um, just because I thought they were doing something. I'm like, no, 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 this is actually, and I remember my friend Jordan standing up and being like, oh, thank goodness, Steph is back. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone just kind of laughing. And I just thought, you know what? And, and it made me laugh as well. Um, and it just made me realize I could have lost every limb on my body in an accident and I would still be the same person. Wow. Um, I would still be that person that wants to get involved. Um, that wants to do well, that wants to challenge, that wants to just try everything. And and I thought, I can still do that. I can't do it in the way that I used to, but I can still do that. It just, you're going to have to find a different outlet. And so I was kind of assessing my options. Um, so for example, okay, I couldn't play rugby anymore on the field and get my com my competitiveness out that way. But instead I joined the trivia team. And, you know, we competed against different schools and um, we were very cool. And that was almost as fun. And actually, the I remember the drama teacher recruiting me and asking if I wanted to come to, to, to drama club. And I had tried a few years ago, but it was just kind of like, look, Stephanie, you're so busy with sport and I can't cast you in a play if, you know, you come back with a black eye. Um, it's, just, <laughs> it's just not going to work. Um, and so I did that and, and then just set new goals. I wanted to be a, a doctor. I wanted to be, sir, my doctor creator was amazing. And I thought, my goodness, if I can do that for someone like that would be a great life. Wow. So he was your inspiration. He was. And so I just, I got, um, I thought, well, okay, I'll just take all that competitive competitiveness and I'm going to invest that back in academics. I'd always loved school. I just hadn't quite had the time to to invest and and so that was a new outlet and you know life will always turn up with with different things if if you just stay open to it you made lemonade you got given lemons and you made some lemonade and you were going to go onto this path of of being a surgeon you get to university you're going through the the, the years of university and then an item comes along mm. And you see this thing and think, let's see how this goes. What happens? So I went to university to study biochemistry, loved university. But it was also at this point in my life when I got my first running blade. Ah. And Well, how did that happen? Someone say, hey, this is a blade. <laughs> Do you fancy putting on, trying how it goes? Uh, do you know what? Actually, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I, I was so lucky where I was in Canada in that there was, they have these amazing organizations. This particular one was called the War Amps. Mm -hmm. And for anyone under the age of 18, they will fund pretty much any leg you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And 
so I and, and there's some parameters and stuff. And when you initially become an amputee, you, you wouldn't normally invest in a really expensive leg because the shape of your leg changes quite a bit over the first five to 10 years. Yeah. Um, your stump changes because there's atrophy, the muscles shrink, um, the tissue fluid is still kind of sorting itself out. So there's no point in investing in a really expensive leg because you're going to have to get it changed pretty much every six months. Mm -hmm. So at this point, my, my leg had stabilized. It was able to tolerate more pressure yeah. as would happen when I, when I ran. And so it really was the first time that I got this running blade. And it was amazing. But you I the first time running yeah. with it? Um, I do. So, okay, the first time, I mean, I, I thought I'm going to, you know, be ready for the Olympics. Let's go. It wasn't quite like that. Um, it was, it felt amazing. Like it actually felt more natural than anything I was expecting. Mm. But again, the thing is, your body isn't ready for it. Feet are amazing in the way that they distribute pressure and force. Um, that happens when you run. But the thing is, I was now running on skin and on the end of my tibia, fibula, on bones that were not designed mm -hmm. for that kind of pressure. So it, it, it's actually quite painful. And it actually takes time for your skin and your bones to toughen up. It happens, but it takes a lot of time. So initially, when I first started running, I could only do it maybe for like five minutes once a week. And I think if I hadn't loved running as much as I had, it just never would have happened. But by the time I got to university and I had this running blade, I was at the point where I, I could actually start training. And one of my friend, one of my my friends on my floor is part of the track team, and I just went along, just and I, I called the track coach ahead of time and just said, "Look, I this is a situation. I just got this running blade. I'm incredibly unfit. Uh, I used to run a long time ago, but now I'm trying to do it with a blade. I have no idea what I'm doing." May I come and, um, you know, train with all of you? And I just thought, I mean, there's no way I'm going to make the team, but I would just love to just... Get in the mix. Just yeah. get, get in the, in mix. the mix. Just yeah. learn. Mm -hmm. And and he was fantastic. He just said, look, I have no idea what I'm doing either, but I'm willing to try. Cool. So if you come and you're consistent and... And, and you show up every day, I won't, I won't cut you, even if you don't make the standard. And I thought, great. Wow. Mm. And that was the start. But then that, that then poses you with a bit of a challenge though, doesn't it? In terms of how you can balance biochemistry and, and your track. Oh, well, that part was simple. I just didn't sleep, <laughs> which I don't recommend. Um, <laughs> yeah, it got, well, as the years went on, so probably by my fourth year, I had actually gotten to the point where I made the able-bodied team travel standard. Wow. Which was wild. That's crazy. And you must have felt amazing by that point. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, even that, it's like, what a journey to come back from. It really was. Uh, I mean, that was just, I remember actually my, my, one of my, one of my final meets with the team, I was, we were away in Montreal and I had run a 60 meters and it was pretty decent. And I went to look at the results um, for, and, I, and I was getting annoyed. I'm like, because I couldn't find my name. And I'm like, oh, this is unbelievable. They've gone and they've separated out the able-bodied and the disabled <laughs> one. This is so ridiculous. And then Coach Wayne came over and he's like, Stephanie, that's you're looking in the wrong spot. Like I'd, I'd actually finished in in the top half, <laughs> and I just hadn't realized my time was that fast. Wow. And it was just so so funny. But yeah, I was really proud of myself for being able to to make it to that stage. And and again. My focus was still on on school, and it was actually it, it was quite quite tough. It was really hard because I'd actually gone on an academic scholarship to study biochemistry, but to maintain the scholarship, you had to maintain a very very high average, right. um, alongside the fact that I was studying for my MCATs and I was finishing off my my mini thesis for my fourth year. So wow. I I didn't sleep very much my fourth year, which I don't recommend, especially when you're trying to do something quite physical. <laughs> um, I'm a firm believer you can do anything for a year. Yeah. But um, beyond that, um, I, I probably wouldn't have survived very long. But it got to the point where at the end of my fourth year, and I had to make this decision, am I going to go to medical school or am I going to try out this ridiculous dream to be a sprinter with one foot, a career which did not exist at that point in time. And it just happened that I was invited to my first international track meet in manchester england hey. england manchester. Oh. yes it was for um the paralympic world cup wow and it was clearly it was a last minute invite i was invited about two or three weeks before 
the event was due to start. I'm like, that's fine. How did they find you? Just seeing your results? World rankings? There? Yeah. Wow. I, I hadn't actually realized I was even listed, but they just kind of, you know, make their way down the world rankings and, and I was next. Wow. So and I've been competing in able bodied uh, competitions all this time? I've been competing in able bodied with my university. And then in the summers, I had attended a few. Um, they had this Paralympics Ontario circuit as well. And so I had attended some of their meets and they had the foresight or they, they would have uploaded all the results onto, I guess, the world server. Oh, cool. um, so that that's how it popped up. And so I got this invite and I went and I had never seen like a disability track meet held in a stadium. And I was looking around and there were TV cameras and it was advertised and there was you know, press and media. Oh, wow. And we were picked Bright up from lights. the airport. We went to a hotel and I was just like, is this for real? And that's looking at that. I just thought, I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know what disability sport, Paralympic sport looks like, but I want to find out. <laughs> <laughs> what year is this? 2006. 2006. I mean, how does it go? First off, how does the competition go? Um, the competition, it, it was great. I, I did well. Yeah. Um, I got I got two PBs, personal bests. Yeah. And um, it was just even being around the other team. At this point, I was competing for Canada. So the Team Canada athletes. Yeah. And, and I just remember having this conversation with Jeff Adams on the way back. We were sitting beside each other on, on the flight back to Toronto. And he really was the one that just said, you know, you're good. But if you want to be really good, you're going to have to focus. You can't split your time. And he even went as far as to invite me to one of his lifting sessions with with a professional S&C coach, uh, basically just saying, um, you know, you need to get a bit fitter, a bit stronger, and you're going to have to commit to this full time. And so it was just great to speak with him and just have that mindset shift where if you want to be great and be the best in the world and everything about your life needs to align to that goal it's almost like nurse 2.0 it's like the next person mm -hmm. coming in and going right you've got these two options what do you want to choose you can't do both you can't be upset and mopey and strong you gotta go ahead and achieve your dreams well you can't be academic you can't be being a, a pro athlete so what do you decide that's tough mm -hmm. that's it, tough it, it was it was really tough but i i just i knew the answer immediately Really? Um, and, and usually my gauge is, okay, which, which option scares you the most? Mm -hmm. And I mean, not that medical school would have been really hard. Of course it would have been, but I knew, I knew I would get through it. I knew I would make it to the end, but this, I had no idea. There was no pathway. There was really no one like to look at and be like, well, that's how you do it. And it, and it terrified me. And I thought, well, yeah, that's the one you need to choose then. And it's not, I mean, I, it is about taking risk, but it's about taking calculated risks. You know, I never advocate for, you know, just do something crazy. But the point I was at in my life, I had just finished, I had graduated, I had no obligations. Mm -hmm. I wasn't responsible for, for kids. Or, like this was the one moment of my life where I actually had the opportunity to take the most ridiculous risk I could. And if it didn't work out, I could always go back. I mean, medical school yeah. would always be there. You can always pivot. And I just thought I will regret it for the rest of my life if I don't at least find out if this is even possible. And this is amazing because your childhood dream of being an athlete, you know, as your profession is suddenly like back on the cards and you thought that was over, you know, this is, I'm never going to do that again. And now suddenly it's like, wow, this could actually happen. Completely. And I mean, to be honest, my dream always was, well, I was looking back at, um, I had a yearbook and it would have been from grade five. So it would have been about 10 or 11 years old. And I had three goals listed. Number one was to win an Olympic medal. Mm -hmm. Number two was to win American Gladiators. Yeah. <laughs> Number three <laughs> was to be an actress. And so, I mean, my dream had always been the Olympics. I just, unfortunately, rugby wasn't part of the Olympics at that point. And it was just, you're right, it was incredible to now be handed back this dream, thinking it was gone and being handed it back in completely a different format, but still in this amazing way. So you decide to go on this path. You take the risk. It's 2006. To, by 2008, you're at the Beijing Paralympics. 
how on earth do you go from kind of just getting into this thing and to to being a paralympian it well i <laughs> run so i actually went to the paralympic trials for athens in 2004 oh. i mean it was literally like my second meet my second track meet i had no idea what i was doing and the hilarious thing was is i was devastated and angry that i didn't qualify for the team <laughs> my mom was just like stephanie like <laughs> If it was that easy, then you would be bored of this goal. And and so um, I ended up moving to Windsor to, to train and to train. In the UK? Yeah, Windsor, UK. Oh, no, sorry. Oh. Um, Windsor, Ontario. Oh, I see. Yeah, Not yeah. with the Queen uh, <laughs> or the King or the no, Queen yeah. at the time, but King now. Um, so sorry, Windsor, Ontario. And, and part of that was because they, I, I'm a firm believer that you know, it's good to, an athlete is an athlete, you know, Paralympians don't need to train with Paralympians, um, able-bodied runners don't need to just train with able-bodied runners. But in this particular instance, I went to go and train with a disability specific club. And and part of it was just because there is some special knowledge involved in running with a blade yeah. and, and just, um, there were just different opportunities there. And so I, I figured that was the best place for me to be. And actually it was one of the best centers in terms of Olympians and Paralympians were coming out of this track club mm. in, in Windsor. So I pretty much upended my life and, and went and moved to Windsor. And All and in, you took the advice, you're like, right, this is yeah. it, I'm going all in. Always all in. I think if you're gonna fail, fail epically. If you're gonna succeed, succeed epically, but no yes. matter what, just go all in. And yeah. so, I went and, and just lived what I thought was the lifestyle of a professional athlete as best as I could. So you do that, you, you, you focus and you get the results, you get into the Beijing Paralympics and you line up for the 100 meters T44 event. What happens in that race? Mm. Well, so I am impressed with your classification knowledge. <laughs> uh, just if anyone's not familiar, a T44, it just refers to the type of disability that you have. And in my case, it was a, um, I competed against other other leg amputees. So actually the first, the first competition I had was the long jump. Okay. And that was my best shot at a gold medal. Um, and that was at, nine in the morning and that same evening at 8 p.m at night i had a 200 meter final oh now the 200 um and then i had the 100 um about five days later but this is a far more interesting story than the 100. okay <laughs> and so I, I i was ranked seventh going into the 200 meters so you know not really looking at the medals but the long jump was the one where i could really surprise and and challenge for the gold I mean, that is nuts. Just hearing that, the, the fact the journey you've been on to then be in a position to win a gold medal at the Paralympics is already amazing. But do continue. It's pretty cool. It, it was. Well, to be, yeah, it, it was amazing and it was very quick. And I, we had had an amazing camp beforehand in Switzerland. Speed, power, strength, technique, everything was, was there. And on the day, I bombed. Oh, I, I bombed. I, I just, I, it, it all happened so quick. I walked into a stadium of 80,000 people, never seen anything like that. And every single jump was a foul apart from one safety jump, which was good enough for second to last place. Oh. And I was, well, ashamed actually and embarrassed. And I just, I had never failed on that scale before and all I wanted to do was hide and just bolt out of that stadium but I remember my coach calling me over and I was I was looking at his chest because I couldn't even look him in the eye and he said to me Stephanie I know this is really hard but I need for you to know that I am disappointed for you but I am not disappointed in you and I just remember the relief at knowing that I would not forever be defined by that one mm. mistake yeah one mistake doesn't suddenly erase your dreams and mm. your talent and the thing is 
I had a 200 meter still to do. So I decided that my shot at a medal is gone. I knew that. But I was going back to that track to run a personal best, just for me. I mean, no one else is going to notice the girl coming home in sixth, seventh place, but it didn't matter because it was for me. And the absolute craziest thing happened in that race. I came around the bend and I was in sixth place and we're at about 150 meter mark and I'm running a great race. You know, I'm doing my absolute best and I can see out of the corner of my eye, I was out in lane nine, the leader trips over her blade and oh, falls. Oh. oh. She then takes out the athlete next to her. Oh. She falls. And at this point, I'm in fourth place. Oh my gosh. And I'm Stephanie, this is never gonna happen again. You get up there and fight for <laughs> that bronze. And I just snuck the bronze medal. I wow. Now, okay, obvious, nobody dreams of winning a gold medal or winning a bronze medal because the two best athletes fall. Mm. And the thing is, medal aside, I was so proud of that performance because in that race, I set a personal best by almost a second. A whole second. Mm. Yes, a whole second. It might, it might not seem like a lot, but in a 200 meter sprint, oh, yeah. that's, loads. that's huge. I mean, yeah, like a, like a, if you did it 0.1 second faster than your personal best, that's, that's Oh, yeah, I'd still be thrilled. <laughs> you know, that's a lot. So it's like a whole second is a, is a huge amount. This was a whole second. Wow. And I was just, I was so proud of myself because if I had started that race, you know, sad and disappointed, instead of fully, fully committed to running the best that I could, I would never have been in a position when everything kicked off at the front. Yeah. And it was just that reminder that even if no one's watching, even if you feel like there's absolutely no way you can win, still do your best. Yeah. And I feel like when you take that kind of pressure off yourself to kind of compete, but you say, you know what, I'm just going to do this for me. Then that's where the magic is because you haven't put that external pressure on you. It's just being you fulfilling your own desire to do whatever it is that you want to do. So that, it's exact, that was exactly what happened. It was almost like I had this freedom. If all I have to do is run a personal best for me, I don't need to worry what anyone else does. I could just go out there and be me and run like me. And if you see the footage, you can see at the start of a long jump, I mean, I am just, I don't look like myself. Mm. I look lost. My coach even said, he's like, your eyes were glazed over. He's like, I knew from the start this was not going to go well but I couldn't say that to no. you and I couldn't snap you out of it. I didn't know what to do. And then you see me come out for the 200 later and I'm smiling and I'm myself and I'm just having a good time. And it is, it's a powerful high performance lesson because we all feel like the way to do good is just to load lots of power, or load lots of pressure and lots of anxiety on ourselves. And it's not true. You can have fun and still do really well. Do you know what? When I, when I watched you at the, the Brazil, the Rio Paralympics, you yeah you're like you for the for the long jump you just seem to be in a good mood and you're smiling and you're getting the crowd going mm -hmm. with the claps i'm like oh it's not what i expected i expected this like not because of you just think of athletes they go into a serious mode and it's about performing i was like wow she's having a lot of fun like and that mate did you then take that attitude on forward to the rest of your career of like okay this fun or, or being positive and feeling good needs to be a part of it I did. And I think, do you know what? I, when I first entered the world of elite sport, I felt like, oh, this is elite sport. We need to be very serious. Like you have to hate everybody. You can't like competitors. <laughs> and, and I tried to do that and it, it just wasn't Not me. You. No. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I'm a fierce competitor and, and you know, I, I go for it. And when we are on the field of play, I am doing everything I can to be you. Um, but at the same time, I just... I do well when I'm having fun. And that's the best part about long jump. You you can get the audience involved. Mm, yeah. And and part of it is as well, it's you are absorbing their energy and you're getting them involved. And it, it moves it from being, for me anyways, it, it moves it from this interpretation of, okay, I'm lining up to take an exam and it's pass or fail. 
And it depends on how far I jump to actually, this is a show, this is a production. I'm here to entertain and have fun. And it was just a much, much better result. But every time I sometimes, I felt that pressure. No, be serious. Do it the way everyone else does it. It almost felt indulgent to have fun, but I knew that that is how you do your best. So don't worry about anyone else. Do it your way. So moving forward, the next big goal is then 2012, London 2012 Olympics. You got four years until then. And some big life changes happen in that time. You meet your now husband, but you both go for a very challenging decision to make. Just walk us through what happens. Mm -hmm. So after about three weeks after the Beijing Paralympics, uh, Brett and I got married. Hey. I do not recommend planning a wedding <laughs> just after no, you get back that's, from the Paralympics. Yeah, um, but it was fine. We made it work. It was yeah. great. And at the time, I, I had just you know finished school and, and Brent had a job and an apartment and a car. And so I moved to Dallas, Texas, which is where he was at the time. And what does he do? Oh, well, yeah. So, so Brent is a software engineer, but he's also a very, very, very good wheelchair racer. Um, and by very good, I mean, you know, world record holder, Paralympic champion, world champion, wow. winner of London and Berlin marathons. So at the time... Where we, did you guys meet? Uh, well, at a track meet, obviously. Of course, actually. <laughs> and so at the time, both Brent and I were going for this, you know, London 2012. This was a big goal. And the problem was I had, I had at this point changed, um, I now competed for Great Britain and my coaching was. Why? So I, I have three passports. Uh, I have a British passport and a New Zealand passport and a Canadian passport. So I always oh. had the option. And for me, anytime that a country hosts an Olympics or Paralympics, there is a huge investment in terms of coaching, ah. in terms of um, performance technology, psychology, everything. Yes. And I, I started my career late. Um, I was in my early 20s. Um, and for me, I just I didn't have time to waste. This mm. was I knew if I wanted to reach my full potential, this is where I needed to be. This is where mm. the investment was. There was no other country in the world that was offering the level of training you could get as a Paralympian. Mm, and and sense. so for me, that was just an, a home Paralympics. Yeah, yeah. pretty no, cool. Nothing will ever compare to that. So there are a lot of rules around it. Um, for example, you have to sit out for a year of international competition. Oh. Um, so I didn't, I didn't compete at all the year after Beijing. And, and then, um, and then that, then that's fine. Then you get clearance to go. But the thing is my training center and my coaching was in London and Brent's training base was in Dallas. And it was probably one of the hardest periods of our marriage for one, you're newlyweds to you're both fully committed to this massive goal and trying to maintain that balance of, okay, I've just said these vows to support this person. And, and yet I also need to have an element of being really selfish and make sure that I take care of everything that I need to take care of to try and be the best in the world. And then we're not even living in the same country, let alone the same house. And it was just, it, it, it was really, really difficult. And I think we, we just came to the point where we just knew, okay, look, we just need to, um, I think the most dangerous thing that we could have done was have one person feel like they've given up on their dream mm. and finish London 2012 yeah. and there being an element of bitterness. Yeah. I think that actually would have potentially destroyed the marriage more than anything. And so we just like the best thing we can do is we're still both in this and you know, this just looks unusual. This isn't going to look at like everyone else's marriage and that's okay. And so we just almost like gave each other permission. Let's just focus on what we need to do. We'll finish 2012 and then we'll come back and we'll figure everything out. Uh, um, but it wasn't easy. Do you have to say in your vows and you are the most important person in my life, apart from the Olympics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, we probably should have written it in to make it super clear. But at the same time, it, it, it was it, it's amazing being married to another professional athlete, like someone who just gets what you're going mm, through. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I get it, it was wonderful, but it was also really, really hard. I see. Yeah, because they're not saying like, oh, let's go to the cinema and eat chocolate and, and uh, popcorn. Like you're both on the same mission um and they get it and you know you'll have friends and family that say wonderful and totally ridiculous things to you <laughs> and and you just know look it's not their world and it's fine um but but he got it and and that was that was great how does london 2012 go what mm. happens it was ugh. 
it was just such an amazing experience. Um, it, even in, in the lead up, I, I remember when I first moved to London thinking that uh, it's, you know, I'm going to have to find a job and I will have to find a way to fund, um, myself alongside, you know, there still wasn't prize money for anything in the Paralympics. Um, wow. it wasn't necessarily professional in that sense, but I, I came fully, fully ready to, to work alongside this goal. And for the first time, um, I had sponsors and Great. people who just believed in me and just saw the value of Paralympic sport and wanted to partner and join me on this journey. And that was just totally beyond um, anything I had ever imagined. And again, just, I caught that glimpse of what Parasport could be in 2006, but to actually see it and um, it was in the main media and it wasn't just me, other, other Paralympians were doing amazing things and showing up on adverts and, you know, having a blade was cool, not yeah. this source of, oh, that's so cute. Look at you doing your thing, <laughs> but wow, like this is amazing. And mm. you know, people are doing real sport and we're like, yeah, we always knew that, but now yeah. everybody knows that. Yeah. And so just my husband said, cause he flew from Canada. He just said, before I even saw you, like I saw your face on, mm. on bags and buses and, and, and billboards. Cool. And that was just, again, beyond my wildest dreams. And then the games themselves, I, I sat, another personal best in the long jump this time they weren't all fouls good um, that, that did you get into the vibe and just have you know have some fun while doing it i i did it, it took a few jumps and yeah, so you, you always know like i think i took my first jump but i didn't ask for the clap and i'm like oh, stephanie that's not you mm. get the clap going just get do the it your cra way. home crowd as well I, mean, I mean it was but the crowd they before you even did anything they just cheered because <laughs> you were there in the yeah. uniform and people just said well is it scary was it was it really nerve wracking? And no, it was just this amazing feeling of knowing this entire stadium, this entire country are behind you. That's and cool. they all clapped and it was the loudest clap I have ever received, you know, going down going down the runway. And I set a personal best and uh, I ended up with a silver medal. Um, the way that competition was, um, I had jumped the furthest but we were competing with above knee amputees. And so they were using almost like a statistical system to to work out who the winner was. And right. and so even though I jumped the farthest, I, I was still in, in second. And the 100 meters, uh, it wasn't as amazing. Um, that was a bit disappointing. But again, the 200 meters, it was my last event. And again, I was not ranked first going in. <laughs> but I just thought, this is your last moment on this track. Enjoy Same it. mindset, yeah. Enjoy yeah. it and, you know, soak it all up. And I ended up finishing fourth with another personal best. Excellent. And I was the last person on that track. It was that scenario where you had the cane and they're trying to pull you off. <laughs> I, just thought, I don't want to leave before I have to because I love it. And, um, yeah, it was an amazing, amazing experience. I wish we'd asked you to bring your medals. That would have been so cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you get a silver medal in the long jump, right? So you're like on top of the world. You're like, I've got this last time bronze. Now I've got silver it's on my way up. 2013 must have been a great year. Uh, it was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I entered 2013 with this idea that, oh, well, now that I've got the silver, it's just going to be easy. Um, I'll just, I'll do the same thing. I'll show up to Worlds. And now that the categories are split out, so a below knee amputees will just compete against below knee amputees, above knee amputees will compete only against above knee amputees. I mean, I'll pretty much just show up and collect my gold medal. Mm -hmm. And this will be my, my fairy tale season. And it just did not happen that way at all. It ended up being the worst season of my life. I thought maybe I didn't have to try as hard anymore. Maybe it would just all kind of happen. And I showed up to the world champs and finished in last. Oof. I remember the worst part was the winner asking me, oh, are you injured? Oof. And you weren't. I was not no. injured. Oh, that's not what you want. And I just thought, wow, this is... Life never gets easy. <laughs> You're never <laughs> yeah. going to reach a point where... You can just roll out the formula and walk on through. And again, it was just at the end of 2013, having to reinvent mm -hmm. my life, 
reinvent again. who I was. And part of it was, yeah, once you've done it once, people think, oh, well, you can do it again. I'm like, no, the problem is you now know how hard it is mm. and how exhausting it is and how it's going to take everything from you. And actually, again, it was sparked by another hard conversation. Okay. okay. Who is it this time? My, a head coach, Paula Dunn, who, again, after a horrendous, I was at a meet and, and ran horrendously, another horrendous 200 meters and I remember going to find Paula thinking, oh, I just need a few words of encouragement. You know, you look great. It'll be fine. And instead she sat me down and said, Stephanie, I think you need to stop running. Oh, just how? And I was like, oh, okay, wow. And I was like, what do you mean? She said, I think you need to give up the sprints. You're not good enough to win the gold. But you could be good enough to win gold in the long jump. And I think you should focus your efforts there. What you yeah, you. How, yeah, how do you take that? Um, it's, it's hard. It's the, the truth. It, it, do, it hurts sometimes. And, you know, in my mind, my original goal was world domination across every sprint event, the 100, 200, 400, the half one long jump. And to be told you're not good enough, it's, it's hard. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, am I going to focus on that? Or am I going to focus on what she, she was actually trying to get at mm. you you are good enough to be world-class at the long jump. Mm -hmm. And and life is about hard choices. And, and life is sometimes about letting go as much as it is stepping into opportunities. And this was a point where I needed to, you need to look at reality. You have to look at real life and reality. What opportunities are there? And it was one of the hardest conversations, but one of the best conversations because mm -hmm. I took her advice. Yeah. I changed everything about what I did. I changed coaches. I changed setups. We just focused on the long jump. We still had to sprint because you have to be fast. Yeah. And the next year I broke the world record. Amazing. Whoa. That's so cool. Yeah, that is, that is. I love brilliant. that. Again, just like that. Okay. All right. I didn't like that, but <laughs> be a bit annoyed for a bit and then I'll just get to work. Yeah. And you just get to work. Just get and to then work. world's record holder. World record That's holder. You really amazing. But you gold. know what? I think it goes back to what you said about freedom, um, because I think what I've realized, I mean, I've, I've hit rock bottom several times in, in my life, and it's a place nobody ever wants to be. Nobody enjoys being there. But the best thing about it is that when you hit rock bottom, that is actually, I think, when you're at your most dangerous. Mm. Because there's nothing to lose, nothing to lose at that stage. Yeah. And that is when you are the most free. Um, you are free to be the most innovative. You can take the most chances because, again, there's nothing riding on it. Yeah, there's no, nothing, no risk. And then, of course, there's no risk, no reward. So it's like a bouncing point. Mm -hmm. I mean, your, your experience at Beijing, I mean, it's not, I can't say mine was quite as similar, but I remember this year at um, my sports day, my daughter's first sports day, I was like, okay, this, they're going to have the dad's race. You know, I've been going to the gym. I've been, I've been on the treadmill. I've been right. I could win this. I love the comparison. Here. <laughs> you get to the start line, the, the whistle blows, everyone starts running. A few seconds later, I realized, perhaps I'm not going to win this. Right? <laughs> I remember one of, the, one of the dad's shoes, shoes fell off, right? Like it flew in front of us all. And somehow another dad, Got caught the shoe and threw it back to him while we were all still running and I still came like <laughs> not quite last but maybe second or third from last. You got beat by a guy whose shoe came off. Shoe came it back, in, yeah, and he got back it back. On. I realised right. I'm probably more built for shot put <laughs> or hammer throw. <laughs> Specialise, Ash. Specialise. Specialise down. Do. That's the lesson. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Specialise. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I specialised in the long jump. And... <laughs> no, but genuinely, I think we all. In our minds, we all want to be awesome at everything. Mm -hmm. And that's just unrealistic. And, and actually, I think life is about finding that one thing you're really good at and yeah. then just taking it to the next level and keep taking it to mm -hmm. the next level. And it's that constant thing of, oh, but I want to keep my options open because what if this doesn't work out? But you have to be brave. And yeah. as I think we said it probably before, you have to go all in, yeah. all in. I'm going to read out your results from this moment. So the moment you decide, okay, all right. I'll stop the sprinting. I'll focus on long jump. So you become, yeah, 2014, 244 European long jump champion. We get to the Olympics, Brazil, Rio Olympics, Paralympic silver medalist, T44 long jump. 2017, world champion T44 long jump. 
2018 European T64 bronze long jump. You just go on a long jump winning spree yeah. for years, <laughs> which is amazing. That is amazing. Long jumping around the world. It ju- I mean, yeah, it just, it sounds, I mean, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? That yeah. this actually, when I was in school, this was not presented as a viable career. You know, mm. it was be an architect or an accountant or a lawyer. Um, but I just think there, when you have a dream and you keep, you don't have to know what the end point is. I mean, I had no idea this was going to be the end point. All you have to know is what that next step is. And if you can see it and you figure out a way to take it, then take it. And you just keep doing that over and over and over again. And, you know, it was over a long period of time. It's not enough to just do it once. Mm. You, you have to be in it for years and years and years. And I just think that any time I go and I speak about high performance, that is the message I want to get across. Like this is what you need to have is the ability to believe in yourself and keep taking those little steps and those little risks year after year after year. And that is when you're going to see the magic. It is not something that's fast. It's not something that you wake up and suddenly it's just there laid out for you. Mm. You have to work at it and you have to go for it. You do have two devastating injuries before Tokyo. We're fast tracking this a little bit, but you, you, you get an extra year to go through that rehab because of COVID um, and you're really there at, at, at Tokyo not this time thinking about trying to get a gold but something else the well I didn't know at the time but the last because I, I retired um, a year ago but Tokyo was my final Paralympic experience and it was without doubt the hardest period of my sporting career. It really was just two years of misery. Um, I had two, as you say, really devastating injuries in 2019, um, which each time they happened, I was told your career's over. Mm-hmm. You you can't come back from that. Wow, and you're like, mm, I've kind of been through a lot. <laughs> watch well, me <laughs> no no i i was I, I was lucky um so the first one was really bizarre i took a really awful landing in a long jump pit right. in 2019 and my knee twisted and they x-rayed it and it was found that my acl had been torn mm. uh, acls it was my takeoff leg as well and i take off Ooh. my artificial leg and so to have the kind of control of your knee required to do that i mean that was an easy you know surgery and and what a year of rehab uh, that was that was twenty, that that was my twenty twenty done. Um, anyways, as it turned out, yes, my ACL was torn, but what they didn't realize is that it had already been torn for about twelve years. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> they have no idea what happened. They have like I obviously, it, do you know what? It probably happened during the initial accident, right. and just nobody ever flagged it, and just mm. somehow my body had adapted, and my knee never mm-hmm. had an issue, so no one ever found out. So, wow. but it it really was that first because no no one just even guessed that could be possible, but mm. um. So we found out, okay, my knee was still a little bit injured, but not devastatingly. So we worked really hard, rehabbed it, got ready still in time for the 2019 World Championships, which are in November. And the very last meet, it was a week before I was meant to fly out. And it was my sixth jump, my very last jump. Again, um, a terrible landing. And I ended up tearing my syndesmosis on my real foot in my ankle. And that, again, is another injury that requires surgery and is very difficult to come back from. Initially, the surgeon said, look, we're not going to operate because if we operate, you will never be ready for Tokyo. So we just tried to rehab it fast tracked. Anyways, um, as, as, as it turned out, Tokyo Olympics got pushed back a year. And so I had a little bit more time for the rehab, but then it was just, I didn't realize it at the time, but I never jumped well again that year because in, in 2021 because I, there was a fear response mm. after those two awful injuries. And even now I can still hear the sound of my knee popping out as I land. I could hear the sound of my syndesmosis popping as I landed. I would stand on that runway and all I would think about was self-preservation. Mm. It was not about jumping far anymore. I was just scared. I'm like, I'm just going to hurt myself. And it was just the most miserable year, 2021. 
I was not jumping well. I, for the first time in my life, was going to a Paralympics, not thinking about, hmm, I wonder, you know, what medal can I potentially win? Um, but will I make this team? Hmm. Will I make this team? And I just, I've never experienced it in my life where I'm just waiting for the season to be over. I thought, I will see this out. I will do the best that I can. But I, I don't have high hopes. I ended up making the team. Um, <laughs> ended up, again, another hard conversation. This time with my, my personal coach, Aston, Aston Moore. Uh, we just came back from Europeans. And I had won a bronze medal, but it was, it, it was a sad bronze medal. I jumped horrendously. Um, and I, it wasn't a performance I was proud of. And I sat down with Aston two days later. And he looked at me and, and he said, Stephanie, I've gone through the data. Speed is there. Strength is there. Your technique looks great. And so I've come to the conclusion that it's not me. It's you. Oh. Oof. And I just say, I know that sounds really <laughs> harsh, but I mean, he, he is saying this with the utmost love. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah still, it's hard to hear. It, it's yeah. hard to hear. But this is, um, you know, I know Aston is on my side. He is on my side 100%. And he is saying this because... He wants me. He's like, I know you're like, I know you can do better. I have the data. This is you. And it was really the first time anyone had challenged me on my mindset. I think everyone just assumed, oh, it's Stephanie. Oh, she's fine. Look what she's come through. She's great. But he was just like, something is not right mm -hmm. in terms of your psychology. Like what's going on? And that was the first time I realized I'm scared. I'm scared every time I stand on that runway because of all these injuries. Oh, and and if he hadn't said that, I never would have realized it. Mm. And again, it just gave me an opportunity to, okay, he's like, well, okay, great. If it's in your head, what are you going to do about it? I'm like, well, I guess I need a sports psych, don't I? And he's like, yeah, go find one. But again, it's an option. Okay, now that you know what's wrong, you have an option to go and fix it. And I ended up finding just the most amazing sports psych, Penny. And, and we talked through. And it just meant that I arrived at Tokyo free again mm -hmm. and I think part of it was just the relief I had made it there yeah. and I stood on that runway and again it was also knowing look even if you get injured there's nothing else beyond that you can just go for this and I jumped the best series of my life wow in terms of the farthest and the most consistent doing that at um 37 36 37 37 years of age which wow. is pretty amazing um, most then, people would have retired by this point. Most people would have retired by that point. And, and that was just not what I was expecting. Now, the thing is, I ended up jumping. I get one of the best jumps of my life. But it was three centimeters shy of bronze. Oh, and yeah. I finished in fourth. Yeah. So literally like that. Less than that. <laughs> Less than that. Really? And oh, it was just, it was so bizarre because... I remember the head coach, Paula, Paula, she was now, she was a head coach, the one who had had that really difficult conversation with me saying that I should go just a long jump. She came over to me and she just said, Stephanie, that was unbelievable. Nobody expected you were going to produce that after the season you had, you know, just well done. And I was so proud of myself and Aston was so proud. Um, and he just said, that is exactly what I wanted to see. Like I couldn't have asked for anything more. And I was so proud. And yet all you're thinking about is three centimeters. Oh. <laughs> three centimeters Painful. like Stephanie could you not have just like lifted your legs up just a little bit more <laughs> and so it ended up being this really bizarre bizarre place um again just challenging my idea of what excellence looked like what did it mean to succeed did I need a big shiny piece of metal for me to feel like I succeeded and it was something I really really had to wrestle through with myself so you 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 have this experience three centimeters at um at uh at the tokyo olympics you go straight into dancing on ice and entering this tv competition with all the lights cameras action that, that involves that and uh and you know and it's a hugely popular show um and then you said to us you had a a, a mental health crisis after that what what happened surely your the career's over you've done dancing on ice feeling great oh, i don't have to do this anymore but, but what happens so yeah dancing on ice was just one of the most amazing experiences possible um and i mean just you were getting essentially paid to learn how to skate and 
the skating was, it was so hard initially. I was terrible, but we kept working at it and we just found a way and, and ended up surprising a lot of people and, and making the quarterfinals. And I actually still skate now. I absolutely loved it. That's cool. But what I was entirely unprepared for was what happened afterwards. So I hadn't, I hadn't decided I was going to retire after Tokyo necessarily. I thought, well, you know, Paris is only three years away, not four, because it was delayed and yeah, I could probably just hang on. But the thing, I got to dancing on ice and it was just, it was so fun and so unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. I just thought, well, there's probably other things in life that I've not yet experienced. And they're probably really fun as well. I've just been so busy. And I think that was then when I just started realizing, do you know what? I'm, I'm so satisfied with my career. I think I'm ready to step away now from athletics. And um, it actually feels more scary to step away than to stay in it. And again, that's my trigger point. Uh... Whatever is the scarier option is probably mine. But the thing I wasn't ready for was I had never really debriefed after Tokyo and just kind of taken time. There's always something we call the Paralympic blues, which is when you've had this major focus for so long and it happens. And even if you did super well, or even if you totally bombed, you still feel a little bit down. So I had that plus the show. He spent six months living in an amazing reality, but not one that's real. You know, you, wow. you don't spend your life with people basically organizing your life and your food and do, you know, basically living life for you while you can just focus on your skating and have the most amazing time. Um, it's wonderful, but it's not real. And if you confuse the two, that can be quite dangerous. But so I ended up, um, yeah, show's gone, career's gone uh, in terms of long jumping and everything just felt like the foundation had just been gone. And I just felt like I was spinning down a really dark path and I didn't know how to get out of it. There's no anchor point. Wow. And it was actually terrifying. Yeah. It was terrifying because, I mean, this wasn't me. Like I was Stefan, I was really strong and I, I never had mental health problems. And yet here I was not able to function in a really basic way. Like, you know, I had a, a toll bill I needed to pay. Um, I'd been on a bridge and forgot to pay it. And it was now three months and it was accruing and I just could not pay it. And you just think, what is wrong with you? Just actually physically couldn't just get on and, and No, do I it. just couldn't deal with it. I right. just could not deal with it. And it's terrifying. And I think what I knew was that, okay, like that part of your life is done and you are about to start a new chapter, which is just going to be totally different from anything else. And it's just really scary. And I think, Stephanie, you've done that before. Like, you know what it's like. Your life got turned upside down and you managed. But the scary thing was just knowing, yes, I've been through it before and I know how hard it is and I'm just tired and I don't want to do it again. And it's scarier knowing how hard it is. And it was really the first time that I just had to like actually ask for help and sit in a room with people where I just cried and they just sat there and looked at you and just in a really loving way. Mm. And you know, just free from judgment and just be, again, just in that really vulnerable position where you don't know how to put yourself together and you need someone else to do that, which means that kind of that power is gone from you. And that's scary. Um, but it was, I think, something every athlete, everyone going through a major life change has to take on. It's scary to let go, but you can't embrace anything new unless you let go of of what you know wow that's very powerful i think if anybody it thinks oh well it's weak to show your emotions or ask for help or to be in this state where you you're not very mentally healthily strong hearing the fact that you went through that and nobody can deny you are an incredibly strong person and character i think it just shows that anybody can go through that experience and anybody should should ask for help and it's not a it's not a weak thing to do it's actually yeah. a very strong thing to do it's necessary because mm. i think again what i realized when you go through that point what happens is your view of reality gets skewed and the best thing that you can do is have somebody bring you back to reality the problem was i didn't my perspective wasn't going to take me there i needed the perspective of someone else to to just get me back on on that path and and yeah start giving me the options showing me okay this is real life this is what you can do go for it mm. well that is the end of your story that is how you became paralympian not just any paralympian 
multiple winning world record holder. And uh, we hadn't mentioned that in 2019, you were made vice president of British Athletics as well, which is pretty amazing. And you now are a, a high performance coach, you're a keynote speaker, you're commentating on massive events, world championships around the world. So it's pretty cool. Um, we end the episode with a poem that Ashley has written while this episode has been going on. So over to you, Ash. Really enjoyed our, our conversation today. There's so much that I'll, I'll take from this and move forward. Maybe even uh, join the track and try some shot put. <laughs> <laughs> so here's our finishing poem for you. It's time to move forwards. Others have, you can too. The catalyst of change from whence this miraculous story grew. Being committed, all in and perseverance, some of the key themes. And to remember, one mistake won't ever erase your true dreams. Find that next step and believe in yourself. You can achieve if you keep on advancing. And let it not be forgotten, even faced with rock bottom. That, in fact, can be your best advantage. If you're lost, you may find yet the key to your mindset can be the opening of life's last frontiers. So now you've heard the story. And I hope you'll be inspired, surely. Who's to guess where Steph's story goes on from here? I love it. May I have a copy of it? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's that my is pleasure. Your story. <laughs>